Horowitz, and it's my pleasure to moderate panel one called Dreaming Big, How the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Investment Law Can Help Build an Infrastructure for the Future. The purpose of this panel is really to set the stage um, for the two to come by talking about big picture questions related to the design of these two bills that are our topic for the day, their goals, and importantly, key questions about how to implement them in order to achieve both those goals and to achieve equity. Um, I, we have really fabulous panelists today. We actually have four of them, including one who's um, zooming in from the East Coast, who may or may not appear and loom in front. Oh, there he is. Hi, Dustin. Welcome, Dustin. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so I'll, I'll just jump right in because we have a lot to say and we don't have a ton of time to say it. I'll start by briefly introducing the four panelists um, in alphabetical order. To my right is Sylvia Chi. She's Senior Policy Analyst at Just Solutions Collective. She previously worked with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, with Verdant Law, with the International Refugee Assistance Project, with ELI, the Environmental Law Institute, and the US Senate. And she has been thinking and writing um, recently about ways to implement these two laws in order to achieve equity. I'm so glad to have you. Welcome, Sylvia. Uh, Kimberly Clousing at the very end of the table is the Eric M. Zolt Chair in Tax Law and Policy at, here at UCLA at the School of Law. Um, she previously was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Analysis at the Department of the Treasury, where she served as lead economist in the Office of Tax Policy. And so there she played a hand, a, a role in designing these bills. And I'm especially excited to hear from her about their um, economic impacts. Uh, Jim Salzman is the Donald Brand Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at the School of Law here again and at the Brand School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. He's a leading scholar of natural resources law, among other things. Uh, Jim, if you want to tout your book later, I'll invite you to do so. <laughs> um, and then Dustin Magenfar is Federal Program Director at the Energy Foundation, uh, also a UCLA law grad. He previously worked with the U.S. Um, Committee on Energy and Commerce as Air and Climate Counsel. And in that role, he served as lead staffer for several uh, provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. And so with these panelists today, again, my goal is to have them educate us both about the design of these laws, how they're intended to work to achieve climate and equity goals, and you know, opportunities and pitfalls along the implementation pathway. With that, I'm, I'm happy to start with you, Dustin. I've asked the speakers um, to give us a bit of an overview of their view of the world, from, um, their perspectives on these issues, and we're going to try and save some time for conversation between and among the panelists, too. So, Dustin, thanks for joining us. Welcome. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Kara. Thank you, UCLA, for having me as a proud alum. It is absolutely a delight to be back with you all. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, although as Kara pointed out my carbon footprint is much lower this way. Um, so as Kara mentioned, I worked on the development of what eventually became the Inflation Reduction Act when I served in the House of Representatives as Air and Climate Counsel for the Committee on Energy and Commerce. So I'm going to start a little bit with some big picture observations on how the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act kind of came to be, why they are the way they are. Uh, with only a brief dalliance into the world of budget reconciliation, I promise. Uh, talk a little bit about big picture goals and then highlight a few provisions of the act that I think of the IRA that I think are particularly exciting. Um, so for the infrastructure bill, uh, Congress passes a surface transportation bill every five years, generally speaking, and at, at its heart is highway funding. And so that bill was the foundation for what became the Invest Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or EJA, which was shaped by the president, the White House, and a small, uh, what they call, gang of senators who really influenced what that legislation looked like and kind of built out from a highway and transit funding bill to include uh, various other provisions. At the time, that was under development, and Congress, after Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, the White House released its proposed American Jobs Plan and American Families Plan, which together called for approximately $6 trillion in investments to address the climate crisis, 
create family sustaining jobs and accelerate the transition to a clean energy economy and to do so equitably and really much, much more, although most of what was the American Families Plan uh, never made it into legislation. But because there was no prospect for bipartisan support for either plan, the actual legislative drafting began under that congressional process called budget reconciliation. So in a nutshell, that is a Senate rule that defined the parameters of what could be included in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is why I'm going to talk about it for a minute. The major advantage of budget reconciliation is that, that legislation such legislation has privileged status in the Senate, which means it's not subject to the filibuster and it needs only a simple majority to pass. But in order to be able to use that process and enjoy that privilege, there are strict requirements for such legislation that has to comply with what's known as the Byrd Rule. Basically, if a provision of a reconciliation bill does not have a budgetary effect, it doesn't either produce a change in federal spending or in federal revenues, then it's considered extraneous and it can be struck on the Senate floor and ultimately not make it to the president's desk. And even if a provision has a budgetary effect, if its policy effect is deemed to outweigh the budgetary effect, then even that can be struck. And that played out very publicly in the American Rescue Plan, where the effort to increase the federal minimum wage was struck from that bill, even though it had a budgetary effect because its policy effect was deemed to outweigh it. So I'm not going to go further down that rabbit hole, but the key takeaway is budget reconciliation and those rules are the key reason why the Inflation Reduction Act almost entirely consists of federal spending. And in particular, because spending through the tax code has extensive precedent under budget reconciliation provisions, that's why, as some of my fellow panelists are going to discuss this morning, nearly two-thirds of the climate spending in the IRA happens through the tax code. So to take a step back, the big picture goals of what Congress was trying to do here is even though the White House had put out those uh, proposed white papers on what the bills could look like, those weren't legislative text and they weren't written solely for reconciliation. So Congress really started in the House in particular by looking at existing legislation and existing ideas that could be adapted to the budget reconciliation context. The reality of the amount of time and the bandwidth of staff and members to produce this legislation is that there wasn't a lot of time to consider brand new whole ideas, but really to build from existing legislative proposals that have been under development for some years. And the goal for climate was really to do as much as possible subject to reconciliation constraints to address climate, help frontline communities, shore up existing laws like the Clean Air Act and its ability to address climate change, uh, create good jobs and onshore supply chains. And that is to a large extent where the Inflation Reduction Act landed. It is industrial policy legislation that is creating a lot of new manufacturing and supply chains in the United States. And another big purpose of both the infrastructure bill and the IRA was to be able to show the American people that government works, that government can solve big problems, and it can produce meaningful improvements in people's lives, uh, which is a big part of the work of implementation. So the IRA wound up being almost entirely carrots, which is to say money in order to address climate. It didn't start that way uh, for folks who followed it. For a time when it was in the House, uh, there was a provision called the Clean Electricity Performance Plan or program, I think, um, that was a $150 billion provision that would have created both incentives and uh, fees or fines, penalties, depending on how it was defined, on electric utilities in order to replicate a clean electricity standard and try to move the electricity sector more quickly to, um, to clean energy. That provision made it through the Committee on Energy and Commerce, but never made it to the House floor. Besides that, probably the only stick in the bill is the methane fee, uh, but even that came paired with $1.5 billion in grants to the industry to be able to reduce its emissions of, of methane and be able to comply with the methane fee. So a couple other provisions I want to highlight uh, with my last couple of minutes here at the opening. There were a set of provisions in the IRA that uh, I at least refer to as the Clean Air Act Amendments of 2022 as their informal title. This was seven or eight new provisions added to the Clean Air Act itself in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, almost entirely spending oriented, again, 
but to really bolster the role that the Clean Air Act is playing on climate change and to provide additional direction to EPA. Some of those, as I mentioned, include the methane fee, uh, which is designed to reduce methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. Uh, there's another $5 billion program called Climate Pollution Reduction Grants, which is uh, likely the largest infusion of money to the states uh, to hire staff to develop plans to be able to address climate pollution. Uh, it's $250 million for that purpose and almost $5 billion to implement those plans, which is EPA has begun rolling that out now to really increase the capacity of states to be able to address these issues. Um, there's a lot of provisions that address transportation, both in the Clean Air Act and otherwise. Uh, David mentioned that during his keynote address that we see new rules coming out from EPA today, proposed regulations for light and heavy duty vehicles. The IRA and the infrastructure bill have changed the economics of uh, clean uh, vehicle electrification and reducing emissions from the transportation sector through new tax credits, grants and loans for battery manufacturing and battery recycling and critical minerals development, and a grant program for heavy duty vehicles, including electric school buses. And those provisions have really changed the analysis that goes into uh, EPA's development of a rule in terms of what kind of standards they can promulgate uh, for to reduce emissions. So in a sense, the sticks are now the regulatory agenda uh, paired with the economic incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. And then the last provision I'll mention is a new loan program at the Department of Energy called the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. This provides DOE with up to $250 billion in lending authority to be able to retire, uh, transition retired or retiring energy infrastructure, such as coal plants, but by no means limited to them, to clean zero emission infrastructure. So imagine being able to replace a retiring coal plant with renewable energy and battery storage and to be able to take advantage of the existing transmission infrastructure associated with that coal plant so the new clean electricity can come onto the grid, uh, while also addressing energy burden for ratepayers and addressing the rates that they pay uh, that are often very high because of coal plants and uh, investments in those facilities and cleaning up the coal facility itself. So it's not a blight on that community and instead can go back to a productive, uh, new productive purpose. So I will stop there with that stage setting and highlighting a few provisions and look forward to the discussion after. Thanks, Dustin. And I'll say I've had the pleasure of citing the Clean Air Act amendments of 2022, as you call them, Dustin, and Dustin's analysis of those amendments twice now to the DC circuit. Um, so thanks for that work. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Kim next. I'm curious, Kim, to hear more about your perspective as a tax expert on these provisions and how they're likely to work. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me. Um, it may seem strange to have a tax expert in a room with so many climate experts, and I will say up front that I'm not a climate expert. I uh, am, am merely one who uh, dabbles in climate from the perspective of tax. But, uh, you know, it turns out that tax is quite relevant, as we learned from Dustin and, and David, because the form that our climate policy is taking is, uh, in many uh, examples, going through the tax code. About two-thirds of the total dollars are, are basically tax reductions rather than spending and rather than regulation. And you might say, well, why didn't the federal government take an approach more like California's, where you regulate seriously and where you also have emissions trading systems and other um, things that actually have sticks as well as carrots. And the answer is, of course, politics. The federal government is not California, politically speaking. Um, what we could do through regulation is quite limited um, by the courts, you know, and there are some things that were mentioned by David uh, and uh, Dustin that are helpful in this area, but, but it's not enough to tackle climate change. And when it comes to uh, sticks, you know, it takes 60 senators, unless you do it through reconciliation. We don't have 60 senators that are interested in sticks or even carrots for that matter. So we're down to 50. We have exactly 50 Democratic senators. I think the form that this took really reflects that narrow knife edge balance. And there are probably ways that this could have been even more effective if it weren't for some of the compromises along those lines. Um, but let's start by celebrating here. There's a lot to like in this, and I think that uh, D David's uh, keynote was justifiably upbeat. You know, it's great to sort of think about this huge slew of things that we're able to do and contrast it with maybe what would have happened if we 
you know, hadn't <laughs> managed to get this particular political coalition together and we were, we were instead in a second Trump administration, things would look very, very different. So I do think this is a huge step forward for the climate. The models suggest that this will get the United States roughly halfway from where it was going under business as usual to its Paris commitment. So we were going to have a reduction of about 30%. We were shooting for 50. This gets us to sort of 40. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here um, around how effective these provisions will be, and only time will tell whether that estimate is a is low ball or high ball, but it's still certainly moving in the right direction, and that's great. There's a lot of things to like about these tax credits. They're broad. They're um, longer lived than prior um, tax credits and that they don't phase out as quickly. They're more flexible than prior tax credits. They're more transferable and refundable, um, and that enables them to be ultimately more effective. Um, a third thing to really like beyond the flexibility and the scale and the emissions reduction is it helps really build a political constituency for um, continued transition. I think it's exactly right, um, David's answer to that first question in the last panel that one reason we may not fear immediate reversal of this is because it's a giant candy shop. We're handing a lot of money out to um, people who are very powerful, and that will build a, a sort of a constituency for um, those industries that are expanding. When, when wind and solar get more important, when carbon capture gets more successful, nuclear, you name it, you know, those industries will have a constituencies that will continue to back the transition. And that, you know, is a calculus that will help us hopefully continue to make progress in this area. So, you know, that's wonderful. A, a few downsides or concerns that we might also pay attention to in the time ahead. You know, a lot of people have been talking with great um, enthusiasm about how it's wonderful that these credits not only cause the transition, but they might also serve this, that, and the other goal, including industrial policy goals, manufacturing, made in America type stuff. It's kind of my sad duty to point out that when you layer more and more goals onto one policy instrument, you run the risk of making the policy instrument less effective, not more effective. So as one example, the, the made in America type national content provisions will undoubtedly make um, those investments more expensive than they would be otherwise if you're gonna satisfy them. And, and in some cases, they may be impossible to satisfy if you look at sort of the critical minerals requirements in the electric vehicles. We don't make a lot of critical minerals in the United States, even if we expand it to our free trade area um, partner countries, you know, that there's still gonna be enormous shortfalls if you wanna get up to the targets that are implied by that legislation. So it's not always possible to do everything that you want kind of with one goal. And I, I think we should be aware of that because there are downsides associated with that too. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the international reaction in a second. Um, a second concern is kind of how expensive this all is. And there's kind of like more than one way to think about that. Um, on the one hand, it's really good if this is more expensive than we thought, right? So for instance, the estimates that have been mentioned or this might cost you know, three or $400 billion. Other estimates are suggesting this might cost more like a trillion, right? On the plus side, if it costs a trillion instead of 400 billion, that's kind of great. That means take up was really high. That means we're gonna be doing even more. Um, Fabulous. But on the other hand, that could lead to a lot of fiscal pressure, right? We're in a high deficit, high debt scenario. Um, future Congresses might say, hey, this is like the candy store is a little too generous. We're going to have to shut this down. Um, you know, so there's some concern, uh, you know, about the fiscal burden associated with this. I, I don't think it should be, you know, it's not all downside. Like I said, it could be more effective if you spend a lot. Um, you know, and this is kind of the flip side of some concerns that some of this will be hard to do, right? So it's, you might say, you know, if, for instance, if your permitting worries are real, and I, I do think that David did a nice job sort of explaining why we might worry a little less than some have, but I do think it's very difficult to build things in the United States. Um, I don't think I need to explain to an audience in California like how hard the the <laughs> uh, high-speed rail project was, for instance, you know, like, so what we don't want to do is have huge dollar amounts that then end up turning into not much actual activity, right? So I do think that that's also another fundamental challenge. 
that we should be open and flexible to revising permitting rules. Um, I think a lot of what David said in the prior panel is very encouraging, but I think there's a lot more work to be done there to make sure that this money is spent effectively. Um, and it can be very hard um, to be efficient here. Um, one more issue that I think is worth uh, turning to before we kind of get to the international reaction, and that's the um, distributional effects. When we look at this legislation, there are a lot of things that do seem to be um, reassuring, like there's attention paid to communities that have been left behind. There's attention paid to the fact that, you know, emissions reductions themselves are really helpful to the, to the low income communities. But we have to keep in mind that somebody gets this enormous amount of money. And when you look at who gets this enormous amount of money, the tax policy center estimates, which I think are very good, it's a nonpartisan um, group, suggest that this is a very regressive set of spending, like the top 1% get a much higher increase in their after-tax incomes than the, the bottom 80% do, um, you know, with their benefits averaging about $11,000 per person and those benefits in the low hundreds for, for people lower in the, in the income distribution. So even though all of those are benefits, right, it's still the case that the vast majority of the benefits are going to those at the top. And I think that that's a concern because money isn't free, you know, like, it may be like, well, if you had done pricing instead, for instance, if you'd had a carbon fee, people worry a lot that that's regressive because energy spending is higher in lower deciles than it might be at the top relative to their incomes. But it's not that regressive. It's like, it's pretty close to flat, that one. Whereas this one is giving a lot more to those at the top than those at the bottom. And that money is coming from somewhere. It's coming in the forms of higher deficits that will make it harder for the government to do other things, or it's coming in the form of higher future taxes, right? So I think we at least need to be honest that this too has distributional impacts and that those you know, hundreds of billions of dollars won't be spent evenly across the income distribution. Uh, just two more tiny things. One, international considerations. You might think that uh, the rest of the world should be very, very happy. And I think they are somewhat happy with the fact that the United States has done some things here. You know, like it's, it's great that we're not leaving Paris and, 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 you know, pretending that this isn't a problem. Like we're clearly very engaged in uh, worrying about the climate. We're not always super engaged in thinking about how our actions affect other countries, though. And I think that that comes with some serious downsides that we might want to spend some time contemplating. For instance, imagine you're Canada, um, uh, and you've got a system that imposes costs on your firms, right, um, through uh, carbon fees. And you know, and you're also doing some subsidies too, right? But your firms are competing with the American firms that are next door. Right, the American firms have access to cheap electricity and all these extra credits, and you know, and your firms are paying for for the dirty side, right? That creates a sort of a competitiveness discrepancy that that could end up, especially if this becomes more expensive than we thought, being kind of a thorn in the side of trading partners. And that's before you get to the national content provisions, which are just kind of reckless disregard for a long standing um, international trade commitments that we've made. And, and you know, and, it, and you could imagine could it also create a sort of, sort of zero sum dynamic where other countries do that too. And then we have all these like siloed industries that would be less efficient than they would be otherwise. This one final note on the future. So I think this is a great um, stepping stone to build on. I, I would say that we shouldn't take it as a model that it will always be like this in the United States. These political coalitions are very fragile. Uh, politics change. The, we're going to learn from the Inflation Reduction Act how effective this was. Um, and the whole tax code is definitely opening up again in 2025. You might say, why 2025? That's so soon. Uh, and the answer is all of these Trump era tax cuts that went into effect as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are expiring. And there's a big all the individual side ones. And, and there's a big impetus to extend these um, on both uh, sides of the aisle. And so extending them costs, you know, around $3 trillion. And so people are going to be looking around for things that might raise money um, or might reduce spending. And that's both an opportunity and a risk in the area of climate. I think it's an opportunity to sort of look at um, ways to, 
maybe couple some of our carrots with some sticks and raise some money at the same time. But it's also a risk that people will look at these programs and with a lot of scrutiny when they're trying to look for dollars to spend on tax cuts for Americans. Um, so this is just you know, a reminder <laughs> that nothing is ever really, really static here. So we need to sort of be thinking in a, in a future-oriented way about how these provisions and other provisions that might complement them uh, might arise in the future. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, and so next, we're going to hear from Sylvia. I believe Sylvia has slides. If folks can start the slideshow. Oh, perfect. And uh, Sylvia, I imagine you might want to pick up, especially on some of the points that Kim made about distributional effects. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Yes. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Sylvia Chi with Just Solutions Collective. Um, we, if you don't know about us, we're a new organization. We just celebrated our second year um, and we- Happy birthday. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, we, we, we were previously the 100% network. And um, what we do now is we identify and promote just solutions to climate change from Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous, and frontline diasporas. And um, what I do with just solutions is focus on policy and specifically federal policy. Um, so we've heard a lot of uh, good information about the Inflation Reduction Act so far. Um, I have some graphs that kind of illustrate what Kim was getting at. Um, and the, the real takeaway from this graph is just that orange bar shows the tax credits and it just really dwarfs all the appropriations in the bill. Um, and the vast majority of it is um, for environmental and climate purposes. Um, there's a little bit of other stuff that has to do with like healthcare and, and whatnot, but um, this is the overall picture. Um, so I'm talking about equity and environmental justice. Um, and one thing that I often get asked about the IRA is how you define low income and disadvantaged communities. Um, and the answer is there's lots of different ways to do it, and the IRA does not have one uniform definition across the whole law, um, mainly because of the reconciliation rules that Dustin mentioned earlier. Um, and also for those who don't specialize in this area, um, disadvantaged communities are different from low income communities. Um, disadvantaged communities is kind of the term of art that we use for to describe environmental justice communities, meaning the communities that bear the most pollution burden. Um, yeah, and then just this is just a demonstration. This table shows how there's kind of different definitions, even within two different very, uh, but closely related uh, energy rebate programs. And I think what this, all this variation adds up to is confusion for the communities on the ground because they're they're like, well, why do I qualify for this program but not this program when they seem very similar? Um, so because the tax credits make up the vast majority of the climate action, um, I wanted to start there. Um, as um, was mentioned, they are, um, they last for 10 years. Um, they are incentives for a lot of different activities, but mainly um, most of them are expected to go to electricity generation. Um, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in how this will actually play out. This graph is based on the Joint Commission on Taxation's estimates, and um, there are you know, certain drawbacks to the way they do their methodology. Um, and also there's a lot of like new uh, elements to the policy that I think are difficult for them to model. Um, in terms of the, the distributional effects, I think it's also important to keep in mind that there's uh, the vast majority of the tax credits are for commercial purposes. Um, and again, this will be a little diff this is a little difficult to kind of play out the results of this because some of these commercial tax credits, are now available to be used by nonprofits and local governments through a direct pay mechanism. So previously, these organizations, because they're tax exempt, were not able to use tax credits, need to have tax liability to apply the credit to. Um, now they can use a direct pay mechanism. Um, so 
it will really depend on how these entities decide to act and whether they decide to use these in, in a really robust way or not. So that might change the picture. But in general, um, these tax credits will directly benefit corporations and potentially these other entities. And then also, as Kim mentioned, um, the primary benef beneficiaries of the individual tax credits are the rich. And specifically for um, the energy credits, there has been very little like research about how this has worked in the past, but the research that has been done shows that the vast majority of it goes to the, the, the richest American taxpayers. And um, if you think about it, it makes sense. About 40% of households pay no federal income tax because they're essentially too poor. So again, no tax liability, no credit. Um, and then approximately a third of American households are renters, so they can't take advantage of a lot of these same credits in terms of energy efficiency and putting solar panels on their roof, things like that. So again, a lot of these tax credits, the vast majority of these tax credits will not benefit low income people. There's one program in the tax credits that is has, has a lot of promise, I think, from the equity and environmental justice perspective, and that is the Low Income Communities Bonus Credit. Um, and this is uh, an adder program to the investment tax credit, um, which um, uh, consists of a 1.8 gigawatt annual capacity limitation that if you have a project that you want to apply for, well, that you want to develop, you can apply to Treasury to get this bonus amount of credit. And there's two different uh, buckets within this program. You can get 10% increase in the credit amount um, if your project is in a low income community or if it's located on Indian land and a 20% increase if it's uh, on a affordable housing project where the financial benefits of the electricity produced are allocated equitably among the occupants, or if it is a, a qualified low income economic benefit project, which is essentially a community solar project where 50% of the financial benefits of electricity are provided to households uh, who are low income. Um, so these two projects, um, or, or these, these two uh, categories are um, basically meant to uh, assist small wind and solar in low-income communities and to benefit low-income communities. But there's a lot of questions, of course, in the implementation. And specifically, the one that I think is the, the highest priority is, uh, will Treasury require the pro that all projects that are cited in low-income communities or on Indian land, will they, require, will they be required to provide benefits to the community? because the statute does not require that. And it could very well be that the case that the entire uh, allocation of credits gets gobbled up by projects like putting solar on Walmarts that happen to be in a low income community that doesn't actually provide any benefits to the people in the community. So I think that's one big, big question. Um, and then the other question is, how do we define benefits and financial benefits and equitable allocation? So these are all things that we're in conversation with Treasury about and lots of other people are too. Um, a couple other programs that I think have um, a lot of opportunities for advancing equity and environmental justice. I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, there's a lot of information on the slides. Hopefully we can share them afterwards. For sure. Um, so the, the other one is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, this one is the single biggest uh, appropriation uh, in, in terms of the, the climate action in the IRA. Um, it's $27 billion and that's, that's broken into two different buckets. The Zero Emissions Technologies Bucket, which is $7 billion. Um, and then $20 billion, they're calling general and low income assistance competition. Um, that's basically the, uh, the green financing national climate bank program you may have heard about. Um, and that one will go towards projects that reduce air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions and energy costs. Um, 
so these are both uh, programs that just have like a lot of potential because there's not a lot of restrictions on what the money can be used for. And there is there are carve outs for these projects to be cited in or benefit low income and disadvantaged communities. Um, and I think because they're, it's so flexible, I think it's a great opportunity to address the gaps that the other programs, especially the tax credits, create. And so I would really like for them for this these programs to go to benefit renters, for example. Uh, the home energy rebates I mentioned earlier, um, it's almost $9 billion for two, the, those two different rebate programs. They will be administered by states. Um, and there are some provisions to um, target low and moderate income households. Um, so I think that there's some potential, there's a lot of potential in this. Um, I think especially because it is one of the, the most kind of direct like consumer facing programs that people will interact with. Um, but there's um, a lot of questions about like how about the implementation that are still being worked out. Um, one question is, will 40% of the benefits go to households in disadvantaged communities? Um, and that is raised by the Justice 40 initiative that the Biden administration has been talking a lot about. And that's the, uh, the administration's goal of directing 40% of the benefits from climate investments to flow into disadvantaged communities. Um, yeah, and then there's a lot of other questions that are raised by this as well. And then I also wanted to touch briefly on some of the grid-related programs in the uh, Infra Infrastructure Act. Um, there are several programs in the infrastructure law that have to do with the grid. Um, Basically, uh, most of them have to do with like improving resilience and reliability. And some of them are like specific to um, rural and remote areas. Some of them are for demonstration projects. Um, most of them have not been implemented yet, or some of them are still in like the early stages of implementation. Um, so there's still a lot of opportunity to shape how that's implemented. And I think there's a lot of questions about how that will how these will affect energy affordability, especially for households with a high energy burden right now. And then will this address the needs of the most vulnerable households and communities, especially in terms of like resilience and reliability, the, the communities that are seeing a lot of power outages, for example. So I'll just end with a couple of um, program and policy design elements that we are uh, recommending to the agencies about how to implement these programs. We've been writing a lot of like comment letters to these agencies about how they can make sure that these programs are implemented equitably. And, and these are some of the recommendations that keep coming up in a lot of the different programs. Um, one of them is to work with and compensate community-based organizations. And um, they can, CBOs can be very effective with um, program administration and we have a great example in California with the Solar and Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, where CPOs are part of the program administration team and are, have done a, a really good job with that. Um, and also just community engagement and outreach because these are the organizations that are known and trusted in these communities that we're trying to reach. So working with them and, and giving them the resources to do the work um, is a really effective way to make sure the program actually reaches the people they're trying to benefit. Um, defining the benefits and priorities of the programs um, should be based on community engagement to make sure that we're actually meeting the needs and priorities of the people we're trying to benefit. Um, and then the, that community, community engagement has to be actually accessible. Um, and that means um, scheduling it at the right time of day, the right time of the week, um, having the right kind of food that's available and childcare. But also um, just you know cultural competency and language access, especially language access is um, something that the federal government has a lot of room for improvement on. Um, and then yeah, transparency, accessibility, um, capacity building, technical assistance to CBOs, which basically means just like giving more resources to CBOs so that they have more bandwidth to solve the problems that they're working with. Um, 
and prior, prioritizing the, the right projects, re recipients and beneficiaries, um, ensuring accountability to impacted communities so that there's um, the, the people in these communities actually get a chance to have their voice meaningfully heard. Um, and then also applying safeguards to address potential harms. And um, one that's especially uh, relevant that comes up a lot is around tenant protections. So for example, in the rebate programs, there's a concern that um, if landlords use the rebates to upgrade and electrify their apartments, then they will raise rents and then displace the existing tenants. So um, that's something that is of particular importance, I think, in California, where we have a terrible, terrible housing crisis. Um, I think that is it for me. So I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. And I hope we have a chance to dive into some of these questions in more detail in the conversation. So, Jim. If you could bring uh, some slides on. Yeah. Jim also has slides. Thanks so much. Yeah. So hello, all. So um, the, the topic I'm going to talk about uh, has already been foreshadowed by uh, David Hayes' presentation, by Kim's as well, in, in very simple terms, uh, we've proven that we can fund it. Uh, can we build it uh, in a um, in a reasonable uh, amount of time? This is based on an article that I've written with J.B. Rule, who's a longtime collaborator at Vanderbilt. It's coming out um, coming out this fall. So, if you look back to the 1970s, uh, when basically all of our environmental laws were passed in a very special political political moment of bipartisanship on the environment. Um, Obviously, people were not sitting across the table doing a, a single negotiation. But if you look back, it's pretty clear that there was a grand bargain that was struck. And the bargain essentially was, uh, we will uh, strengthen environmental protections. We will improve the environmental quality in the United States, but we're going to do so at a cost. And the cost is going to be more expensive infrastructure, and it's going to be slower infrastructure. And in fact, that's, that's precisely what's happened. The, the quality uh, of almost every environmental measure, toxics less so, climate, uh, greenhouse gases not at all. But apart from those, uh, our environments are much cleaner than they were in the 1970s. Uh, and our infrastructure is much slower uh, to build. Uh, and so uh, it was a good bargain uh, in that respect. Um, but it's come with drawbacks, right? Historically, as the 1970s moved into the 1980s, the election of Reagan, the Gingrich, 105th Congress in 1994, there was very strong pushback uh, by property rights interests, by development interests, um, on the impacts of not just environmental law, but environmental law in particular, uh, on infrastructure development. Um, and uh, in part from what we just heard, environmental justice interests basically said, hey, uh, when these laws were passed in the 1970s, no one was thinking, much less writing, uh, in the laws about the uh, distribution uh, of these harms and these benefits. And the environmental justice movement sort of arose in that, in that era. And so um, while you've got these sort of uh, forces pushing against the laws that were passed in the 1970s, we're also seeing infrastructure slow down uh, and become much more expensive to build. And so JB and I wrote an article a few years ago called What Happens When the Green New Deal Meets the Old Green Laws? I, I think you know the answer, right? Uh, and that's essentially what we're talking about, what we're talking about here. Uh, and Green New Deal obviously is shorthand for the IRA and for the, um, and for the Infrastructure Act. And so what I'd ask you to do a thought experiment. Uh, if you look at the range of types of infrastructure and the scale that people are saying we need to build and build quickly to make a difference, it really is unprecedented, except maybe World War II. Uh, look at all these sort of major, major infrastructure um, systems that we've created. Most of these uh, were all built before the 1970s laws, all right? So, you know, it was, it was much faster. Um, and imagine doing that together now in the next 20 years. Uh, so, you know, while, while David is absolutely right, um, the trend towards ambitious targets and goals is incredible. It's, it's heartening, but there's got to be a flip side to that. And David acknowledged that, right? And that is, can we, can we build this in a reasonable period of time? And as Kim said, uh, can we build anything, uh, <laughs> to, to, be, to, be, to be more blunt? So what do we know, um, sort of empirically? There's been quite a bit of research uh, on uh, costs and timing for infrastructure over the last... 20, 30 years, uh, and essentially every study that looks at infrastructure shows costs have increased, inflation adjusted, 
and timelines have increased. One of the uh, most telling studies was done at NYU. They looked at um, urban rail around the world and building urban rail in New York City is 20 times more expensive per kilometer than in Korea, triple the cost compared to Sweden uh, and Japan. Uh, there's been a lot of focus when people talk about these issues on NEPA. David pushed back against that. I would push back against that as well. NEPA is an issue, but it is by no means uh, the major source of delay in these projects. There's uh, been a lot of research done on, on the permitting time for NEPA. The problem, and I really want to emphasize this, if you look at the, the, the projects that take a long time, and complex projects take a long time because they piss someone off and they're going to hire lawyers, it's the litigation that causes the real significant delays, not the permitting. And so while the permitting reform is important and significant, it's only one part of the story. There's, there's got to be the, you know, after the permit is issued, that's really when the fun begins uh, in terms of the lawyers getting involved and the delays that, that you get. I want to emphasize as well, this isn't, JB and I don't mean to beat on environmentalists or to beat on environmental laws. There are other factors that are leading to delays. David talked about some of them, financing and such, but environmental law is part of, is part of the story. Um, and the fact is, you know, there is no green pass for big renewables projects. In the article, we go through these four categories. It's not hard to find major projects that are really, really delayed or still haven't been built. Those of you from the East Coast, Northeast, might, may have followed Cape Wind. That was a 16-year death spiral. Uh, there's a new vineyard wind that's come up. It's not clear that's going to go forward too because of the litigation. Um, the, uh, if you're interested in this, the Sabin Center, S-A-B-I-N, uh, at Columbia does terrific work on this. They've got a lot of reports that, um, that, uh, that document these. They, they found that in, in Iowa, because of wind moratoria developments um, in various counties, essentially uh, wind development's been banned in almost half the state or more. Uh, and this is just, you know, large scale um, counties. Uh, moratoriums on solar. Uh, you may know the transmission line story, the, the referendum in Maine, uh, where basically the, the citizens of Maine voted to give the middle finger to, to Massachusetts. Uh, they're, they're not allowing a transmission line to go to go through Maine. Importantly, a lot of the opposition was funded. Uh, the environmental, there were some environmental groups that were important in opposing it. The real funding came from entrenched utilities that didn't want the competition. So it's not just the environmental community that's involved here, but they're using environmental laws in, in, in not in large part, uh, always, but, but in part they are. And then the whole issue with rare earth minerals, right? This, this comes down to the local content. Um, this is the most tragic example. So this is uh, a, a big proposed mining project in Nevada, Rylite Ridge for lithium, which is essential to these batteries. Uh, there's an endangered plant called Teams Buckwheat that has evolved to grow in lithium rich soils. Uh, and so not a lot of places you can, you can move that. Um, and, you know, as you read these projects and the opposition, particularly from local environmental groups, you read the same thing every single time, right? We're in favor of renewable energy projects. We have to have them, but somewhere else, right? And this is a quote from Sensible Solar in New York, which was opposing a, a solar project. And these people are operating in good faith. I don't want to say they're operating in bad faith, but obviously there's a collective action problem if everyone if everyone is doing this. So what we do in the article is basically say, you know, there's been concern about streamlining infrastructure for, for decades. Every administration, Democratic and Republican, has focused on this. And it turns out there's actually a toolkit uh, where there are certain policies that each administration has drawn from, some, some more than others. Uh, you can limit what the laws cover. You can centralize decisions. You can try to speed up timelines. You can increase information transparency. That's a dashboard, the Fast 41 dashboard that David uh, was talking about. The Mansion Bill, which you may have followed, uh, this was kind of the, the side deal in order to get the IRA passed. Mansion was allowed to bring a bill to the floor. It looked a lot like this, and it was just dead on arrival, um, which in, in, in part because it also provided some uh, uh, some um, exemptions for a particular particular fossil fuel project. Um, and you know, last I checked, to get a quid, you need a quo, and that that that's a problem with this. Um, and so, you know, going forward, this is just some examples as well. And I, again, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But this these slides are available, if folks want to want to want to look at them. There are a lot of examples of, of how we can do that. So where do we go? Right? Where do we go next? So it seems to to JB and me, we have we have four uh, we have four options. One is simply to stick with the status quo and kind of muddle through and say, yeah, it's a problem, but you're exaggerating how big the problem is. Um, we think that's just sticking your head in the sand. 
um, tweaking. That's where we are right now, uh, the FAST 41. Uh, there are some other provisions David didn't talk about in the IRA that sort of help with, with centralizing decisions and stuff. Um, we think that's, that's good, it's in the right direction. It doesn't address litigation delays at all. Uh, and it doesn't, I think, meaningfully affect many of the permitting delays. So we can sort of tweak. We know how to do maximum preemption. It's called the border wall, right? You basically can have Congress just preempt all environmental laws. That's no good either. And so what JB and I are proposing, uh, which is frankly more of a thought experiment, but at least to get the, get the um, discussion going, is if, if, if the grand bargain in the 1970s was to slow down development for greater environmental protection, is the grand bargain in the 2020s to increase renewables uh, and to weaken some environmental protection and potentially some community participation? This is a hard, hard problem. Environmental groups have not engaged with it, and I can understand why they don't want to engage with it. Um, Ezra Klein is the only public figure that really has, has centered on this. I can tell you, just because we've been speaking with some Senate offices, the Senate's interested in this, um, and it's going to be hard. And we call it the Greens Dilemma because, you know, these are interest groups that the Greens care about, and there's no, there's no simple way um, to get through this. But our point is it's no good funding a, a Green New Deal or wh whatever you want to call it if you can't build it in a timely fashion. And so the Greens dilemma really is our dilemma. Uh, and that is how are we going to square the circle? How are we going to try to meet uh, these various goals? And for JV and for me, the place to start is to acknowledge it and to talk about it. There's this um, uh, Mike Girard at, at Columbia, who's been a leading figure on this also, talks about trade-off denial. And I think that that kind of summarizes really where we are uh, on, on this debate. Um, so I'll end there, leaving time for questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. Thanks to all of you. Um, I, I, I have a couple questions I'm gonna ask and then I'm gonna open it up to audience questions. Um, but I think I wanna start actually where Jim just left off because it's a totally interesting question. I agree, it's been largely under-examined by the community. And I wanna invite Dustin back into the conversation. So Dustin, if you wanna turn your camera back on, if you're still there and loom above us again, we would welcome that. Um, because I'm particularly interested in hearing both Sylvia and Dustin's responses to what Jim described as the green dilemma, whether you see it as a dilemma, and if you do, how you see your, your way out of it from your perspective. Maybe I'll start with Dustin, if that's okay. Sure. Um... I think, so my my personal take on this is that there's little question that we need to build out clean zero emission infrastructure at a pace we have never done before. And obviously the goal of the tax credits that as Sylvia noted are heavily weighted towards commercial recipients is to be able to facilitate that aggressive build out. Um, but we also have to make sure we're doing it at ways that don't sacrifice the interests of frontline communities that have already suffered disproportionately from both traditional so-called traditional pollu air pollutants right and other water you know land pollutants as well as the increasing effects of climate and so i think i agree more than anything that it's really hard uh, and it's hard <laughs> to figure out where that balance is um and and how to do it and there's there's you know as i see a lot of discussion in the community of uh, the need to figure out how to accelerate project deployment. And, and I'll, I'll mention back to a program I mentioned at the top, which is two of them actually, Climate Pollution Reduction Grants and the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. Both of them, because of reconciliation, are pretty sparse on details in terms of what could be included in the statute. But the former expressly requires an analysis of at least of how a state's climate plan would reduce emissions in frontline communities. And there's other provisions of the IRA that are designed that provide funding to communities to be able to participate in these processes, right? So there's opportunities for funds that would deliver on some of the recommendations that Sylvia mentioned in terms of facilitating community input. And in the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program, the maximum potential of that program involves community engagement and design and transitioning from fossil infrastructure to new clean infrastructure in ways that are going to deliver jobs and economic benefits to those communities. So there are tools to be able to do it. There are all the challenges that Jim mentioned as well. Um, but but how to do that, you know, if there are models that can be built and great examples, and I know there are a lot of groups on the ground that are working on this, um, RMI, for example, has really committed itself to this. 
if we can build successful models of what these projects might look like in ways that facilitate the climate and economic and the community interests, um, you know, that's something that we can hopefully build from. Thanks. And speaking of groups working on the ground, Sylvia, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Um, I definitely agree that it is hard and uh, finding the right balance is the big question. Um, I, I, there's no, there's no easy answer. Um, but I, I think that, um, from my perspective for frontline communities and environmental justice communities, public participation is, has not been available to them. And so I think reducing it from their perspective is not the right way to go. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to operationalize that, but I think that as a principle, I think that that's where I am. Um, I also just want to raise the point that I think a lot of the conversation about permitting reform is focused on like really huge build outs of transmission. And I think we should question how much we need that because if we are able to do more distributed generation, it can be more resilient locally, and then we don't need as much transmission. And I think a lot of these questions, a lot of the debate is uh, greatly influenced by utilities who have a particular uh, interest in a particular outcome. And we haven't heard a lot of the, the other voices um, who would like to see something different. Um, and then the other thing that I want to raise is just about the, the grid investments in the infrastructure law, some of which include, um, like there's a trans transmission facilitation program. Um, there's funding for public participation in these, these projects, in the, in these proceedings. Um, I haven't seen an analysis of what are the gaps that for 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 expediting transmission build out that the infrastructure law does not address and so i think that's where we need to start the discussion is just to see what's what what does the policy not currently do that we need to do before we kind of jump to the next step thanks so yeah i don't know kim if you have thoughts you want to add on this point. Uh, no, no, I second everything Jim said. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I, I also recognize that there are a bunch of representatives of states and localities in the room. So one question I wanted to be sure to, you know, in California, obviously, I wanted to be sure to ask the panel is whether each of you sees opportunities in the implementation of these laws um, that are in the control of cities or the state of California that can help lead us um, toward the goals that we're all reaching for? In other words, what can states and localities do to help us implement these laws in the right way from your perspective, given our audience? And I, maybe, Sylvia, start with you, if, if you have thoughts on this. Um. Well, the first one is what I, I mentioned earlier is uh, using direct pay for the uh, tax credits. And there's a bunch of different tax credits that have direct pay um, available to them, not all of them, but the, the energy, the electricity production and investment tax credits are available. So that could be your city making their own community solar or, or even or larger solar facilities. Um, there's also some I think there are some energy efficiency related ones that are direct pay eligible. Um, but I, I think the main one for me is I would love to see more publicly owned utilities um, or just putting uh, electricity generating like solar panels on public buildings. I think that could make a big difference. Thanks. I don't know if others have ideas on this or not. I can, so, I can add a couple of thoughts, Sarah. Yes, 
I, states and municipalities, I think, are absolutely vital to the successful implementation of both bills, uh, and particularly the IRA. I mean, I'm, it, what we're seeing is there's a lot of capacity constraints. There was a lot of opportunity that came from the American Rescue Plan. Then there's a lot more money coming from the in infrastructure bill. And then with the IRA, there's almost an overwhelming number of different funding programs. There are new opportunities, like Sylvia just mentioned, for direct pay that have never been available, I don't believe, for states and municipalities before. So there's a lot of opportunities that create a lot of um, challenges, I think, for states and municipalities that don't necessarily have the bandwidth to be able to pursue them all and then implement them. And that's why you know, the bill recognizes some of them, meant, invests, as I mentioned before, $250 million into planning capacity at the states to be able to develop plans to address climate pollution. Uh, and there's a lot of other work underway and through the nonprofit sector to support states and municipalities in figuring out how to take advantage of these opportunities. So, but without the a lot of the funding in both bills, and particularly the infrastructure bill, uh, goes through formula funding where it flows through states and municipalities according to existing formulas and laws. A lot of the infrastructure money that goes towards lead pipes and other water resources goes through formula funding. That's all reliant on states and municipalities. So they, they have an absolutely vital role to play and are I think are gonna be determinative uh, in the ultimate degree of success of both pieces of legislation. Thanks, Justin. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to audience questions. And as I, I think I may have mentioned, we're doing questions through the QR code that hopefully you guys have printed on your um, agendas for the day. So if you want to submit a question, you can do so um, through your phone using the QR card. And, um, and Andrea, how are we doing on questions? Is this working? Oh, we have questions. Okay, great. It's working. So Andrea is going to... Um, select a couple to read out. Thanks so much, Andrea. All right, so our first question. Um, we've talked about Korea, Japan, and Sweden's speed of development. Do they have laws similar to our old green laws like the NEPA? And if so, do those create delays and increase costs as well? Or are they successful in environmental protection without slowing development? Yeah, so I'm very quickly going to go out of my area of expertise, like right now. Um, so the uh, my understanding um, is that a lot of it has to do uh, with the role that litigation plays. Um, now, uh, Korea is it's it's, it's 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 a different culture in terms of how the infrastructure is, is negotiated beforehand um, as well. Um, but I think you know there uh, Denmark. I know a lot of folks, and actually folks on the Hill may have may have done this. I know that uh, Denmark has been incredibly successful in building out wind. And so there have been a lot of um, delegations that have gone to Denmark uh, to figure it out. Part of it is a lot more consultation uh, beforehand. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to, especially since it's being recorded, I'm not going to. I'm not going to put my neck out and speculate <laughs> exactly why that is. But I mean, there's something interesting even in that answer. In that additional consultation, in some cases, leads to less delay, not more delay, mm -hmm. right? So there's a way to reconcile. I think the various viewpoints we've been hearing. Um, Okay, so Andrew, what, what else do we have? Yeah, following up on that related to your response, if litigation <laughs> is that bigger impediment, um, how can the delays caused by lawsuits be mitigated? And so that's, I think, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and uh, the, the simple answer is, is preemption um, or, you know, having very tight limits. Um, on, on, on lawsuits, and that's hard, right? I mean, the environmental movement um, legally really is, is undergirded by citizen suits. Uh, and so, you know, where, where do we see preemption? Well, um, you saw to a certain extent in Texas with the, the CRES, this was a very successful build out um, of transmission lines in Texas, and it was just in Texas, so FERC, FERC was not engaged. Um, one thing that we suggest in the paper, more as a thought experiment, uh, is to think about the Military Base Closures Commission. Right? So after 1990, with the fall of the, of the, of the Soviet Union, uh, essentially, we, you know, the Congress realized we don't need to have this many military bases, right? because the threat of a, of a war had receded, uh, and it's going to be impossible politically 
to vote individual bases to be closed. That's never going to happen. So what they did is they created a commission that had standards, basically, for um, what they should look for and coming up with a list of bases that should be decommissioned. And it was they put together the list, and it went to the both houses, and it was an up or down vote. And so obviously the congressional delegations from those districts voted against it and cried cried bloody murder, uh, but everyone else said, yeah, you know, we can uh, we can live with that, um, which was you know w was clever politically. And so would there be a way essentially to identify a small number of you know major transmission um, or, or renewal projects where they say yes, this really is going to move the needle. Uh, and for these particular ones, we're going to basically limit limit challenges to a very uh, specified period and type. Um, you know that's gonna that's gonna be unacceptable to a lot of groups, and I get that. Um, but uh, you know we're in, we're in a space where we're trying to square the circle, and so I think we need to think think outside of our our typical ways. And you know maybe we'll get support for that, maybe not. But it seems to me it's something we should be talking about. Thoughts on this point from any of our other panelists? Okay. Do we have another? Yeah. I think we have time for probably one more. All right. Um, this one, maybe, Sylvia, you can take the lead on answering. In terms of language and other access issues, how can the federal government increase accessibility for those consumer-facing programs? Um, so the, the federal government does, does not provide a lot of material in other languages. I think a lot of us in California might be surprised to hear that because California is actually uh, one of the leading states, if not the leading state, I think, in language access. So if you'll, you probably see um, stuff from the government that comes in all different kinds of languages, perhaps some that you've never even heard of before, um, but that's not the case with the federal government at all. So, I mean, I think the first step is um, for, a lot of these programs where they are trying to directly reach uh, members of specific communities use translation, um, have live interpretation at, um, at meetings and events. Um, I think like in California, we have uh, language access at CARB, the California Air Resources Board. They provide translators, but the um, legislature does not. So we have to bring in our own translators um, when we go in with community members to testify, for example, at hearings. So I think um, just having translators is the, is the very first step and also translating uh, written materials as well. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, and I think with that, we're gonna have to close. One of our panelists is rushing off to LAX directly from here. So I wanna be sensitive to that. Thank you so much, Kim, for squeezing this in. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dustin, for joining us from DC and to all my panelists. This has been a really rich discussion. I appreciate it. Thank you.